To start the August reading wrap up, we're going to talk about the books that I actually finished in August. And these are in no particular order, but first up is Dune by Frank Herbert. This is, of course, book number one in the Dune Chronicles series. And it was amazing. I really enjoyed it a lot. People warn you that Dune is dry and and slow and difficult to get into. At the, at the beginning, like the first half or so, I really didn't feel like that was true at all. I blew through it. I was engaged. It was very interesting. And I think that's just because I was excited to get into this world. The world building is, is incredible here. Uh, but in the middle, I will admit, it did get a little bit... Um, it slows down, right? found that it was easy to put down um, and it was easy to not pick up, right? When I, when I had time to read, I found myself doing other things or reading other things instead of doing. But once I pushed through that... Uh, which it really wasn't like, uh, it wasn't like I was dreading it. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm going to go read Dune or anything like that. It just wasn't like quite captivating me. It wasn't pulling me in. But once I did get past that, about the last third of the book was really incredible. Uh, I did not think forward to how this book was going to end. So when the ending really picked up and everything starts coming together and there's lots of action and lots of interesting things happening, it kind of surprised me and it was uh, a very pleasant surprise. And overall, yeah, it just left me with a really great... Um, a satisfied feeling having finished this book. So I definitely recommend it. It is like it's a little on the dense side. It is heavy, lots of world building, lots of alien words. Uh, but just just embrace it. Just go through it. There's a glossary in the back, uh, so you can so you can learn those terms. And and don't worry about understanding every single weird alien terminology that is thrown your way. Just embrace it and enjoy the story. Next up, I finally finished after like well over a year of just picking this up sporadically and reading a page or two at a time, I finished How Did It Begin by Dr. R. Brash and his wife, L. Brash. I like this book. It was fun. It's the kind of book, again, that you, you know, just pick it up and read a page or two at a time. It's split into all these different categories. So the last couple chapters, the ones that I read this uh, last month, were about the measurement of time, about the origins. Sorry, it's about the origins of all kinds of things in our modern society. Um, the measurement of time, like how the days of the week got their names and the months of the year and, and things like that. Um, the invention of clocks and stuff like that. And then another chapter was about religion and its symbols, like why uh, Catholics eat fish on Friday. Uh, talks about the communion service, the halo, the origins of the cross, all kinds of interesting things like that. I also finished The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Man, I, I can't say enough good things about this book. This is really incredible. It is a satire. It's written, everything's kind of backwards. It's this higher level demon writing letters to his nephew who is a junior demon. And he's like instructing him and giving him advice on how to best tempt and uh, trick human beings into like committing sin and, and being bad basically, you know? Uh, so it's really kind of funny in a, in a weird way. He refers to God as our enemy, and he refers to Satan as our father below, and things like that. So it's all kind of twisted and backwards. Uh, but it's really good. It's, it's really fantastic. And I really enjoyed, after a little while, you start to realize, maybe about halfway through the book, you realize that there's sort of a secondary story happening behind, uh, between the lines. Because this book is literally just all letters. And as, this, as the book develops, you realize that this younger demon has been tasked with a specific person who's like his charge, that he's in charge of like tempting him and ensuring that he goes to hell when he dies, basically. I feel like a lot of the advice of screw, from screw tape is based on like human psychology. It's extremely insightful. And yeah, anyway, I've already talked about this long enough. It's just a fantastic book. And I will reread this probably several times throughout my life. It's really, it's really great. The next one I finished is one that I was reading with my wife, and that is Shadows of Self by Brandon Sanderson. I talked about this in the last monthly wrap-up. This took us a couple months, two or three months to finish, but we finally did get to the end. This is my second time reading it, but it's her first time reading it. I read to her the first original uh, Mistborn trilogy, Mistborn Era 1, and now this is the second book in Mistborn Era 2, the Wax and Wayne books. And uh, really, nothing really to complain about here. It's just not quite as solid as, or not quite as intriguing as the original trilogy. But overall, there's really nothing too wrong with it. Um, the world is interesting. It's fun to see how the world of Scadrial, that's the name of the planet, um, has advanced and changed from the original Mistborn trilogy to now. And it's a lot of fun to see how like certain metals have been discovered and uh, and tweaked with and different Characters have different powers and how they're combined, and there's just lots of fun stuff like that. 
uh, as far as world building goes. I do feel like the plots in these books are a little bit just not as well developed and not as well like explained. Um, to be honest, even just a couple days after I finished this, I was asking my wife like, wait, how did they beat the antagonist of that of this book? Like, I don't, I don't remember how they did it. I finished listening to the audiobook of The Nightland by William Hope Hodgson. And uh, I listened to it on the LibriVox app. This is old enough that it's in the public domain, so you can find it for free on the LibriVox app if you're interested. I definitely, I don't think most audiences would actually appreciate this very much. Um, I did, but I think I was able to get through it because it was audio. I don't think I would have liked this reading it as a physical book. I don't think I would have even been able to get through it. It's very archaic. It's intentionally archaic. Um, and it's extremely repetitive. There's no dialogue in the entire book. So it feels very dry. It feels very slow because it is slow and it's kind of long. Um, there's only like two named characters in the entire book. It's just really kind of weird in that way. Like it's not, it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it like well done, but it's so intensely creative. It's set like billions of years in the future when the sun has died out and these people live in this giant fortress pyramid, and there's all these demon monsters out in the world. If you go outside the pyramid, they're gonna kill you. It goes from like a romance at the very beginning to being like a fantasy. It shifts into a horror story because there's all these monsters, and then um, not, you know, I don't wanna give too many spoilers, but it is kind of obvious. Becomes a romance again, mixed with horror and fantasy, and then, uh, you know, there's no real surprises as far as the plot goes. There is a not insignificant amount of what modern audiences would probably call misogyny. Um, the way he treats this female character, who is the love interest, he's not always very nice to her. Most audiences, you know, maybe wouldn't appreciate it quite as much. Um, I, I just thought, I, I enjoyed it because it's significant in the evolution of fantasy and horror. It was very influential on uh, later authors that came after Hodgson. After I finished The Nightland, I listened to The Mysterious Affair at Styles by Agatha Christie. This is the first book in the Hercule Poirot series. I don't know if I'm saying that name very well or not. Um, but I read The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, which is like book three or four in the series. I read that a while back, maybe last year, and I really enjoyed it. It's really good. And, but then later I watched a video on YouTube about it and it kind of explains the context of the earlier books in the story, in the series. And it explains why the twist at the end of the Roger Ackroyd book was so good and so surprising to people who had read the earlier books. And that really intrigued me and made me think that I wanted to go ahead and, and read this series from the beginning. You don't really need to read these, these books in order for the most part. Um, and so I'm gonna be a little bit loose on that. Uh, but I, again, my library had it available um, on the Libby app. And so I decided to go ahead. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and start from the beginning. And I want to continue this series uh, with any of these books that I can find in order. And if I can't find them in order, I don't mind breaking the order too much. Uh, but it was really good. Sorry, I haven't talked about what it was about at all. This older woman, uh, she dies, she gets poisoned. She's remarried to this younger man. And so he comes under suspicion, but also her two sons are under suspicion uh, because there's some con there's some confusion with her last will and testament about like who's gonna get her money. And uh, it was just really good. And I was surprised at the end. I was surprised at who the murderer actually was. It was really well done. And man, Agatha Christie's just a master at this. So I'm excited to read a little bit more Hercule Poirot. The last book I actually finished this month was one that I read to my kids. It is Wayside School Beneath the Cloud of Doom by Louis Sakar. Sachar? I'm not sure how you say his last name. He's the same guy who wrote Holes. Um, and this is number four in the Wayside School series. We've read the other three earlier. I actually read a couple of these when I was a kid. And so uh, that's why I'm reading them to my children. And they are perfect for like elementary school kids. They're really goofy and wacky. The premise of this school it's really funny. So the blueprints, uh, the school was supposed to be like 30 classrooms side by side and the architect accidentally built them on top of each other. So it's a school that's the size of one classroom, the footprint of one classroom, but it's 30 stories tall and they have all these wacky adventures and it's just really a lot of fun. This is book four, like I said, it's not as solid as the earlier books in the series. Definitely some strong points. It had a couple moments where I thought it was really funny and really clever. But overall, uh, I really liked the earlier books a little bit better. But yeah, really fun story. If you have like young kids, I would recommend checking it out. 
So those were all the novels that I read, uh, but I did read a bunch of short stories this month as well. I read The Scythe by Ray Bradbury. This is in the collection The October Country. And uh, this is this was a really fantastic story. I made a short about it here on YouTube, and I only do that with stories that I think are really, really good, uh, really impressive. This family that's like really poor and they're like on the edge of starving, they run their car till it's out of gas, and they're, they find this house uh, in the middle of these vast wheat fields. They go inside and there's a dead guy inside and they kind of take over the house. And there's, uh, again, wheat fields. And so the dad of the family starts cutting the wheat, harvesting the wheat, and weird things start to begin happening. It's got a supernatural aspect to it. It's a little bit creepy, uh, but really just intriguing and, and just a fun story. I really liked it. I read a few essays, I guess they're essays, you would call them, by Albert Einstein in this book, Out of My Later Years. Um, some of these are really interesting and some of them are just way over my head. So I read The Theory of Relativity, which I think I understood maybe 10% of it. Uh, I tried to take it slow and like walk myself through and take it piece by piece and say, okay, this means that, this means that. But man, pretty soon he's just throwing all these terms out that I've never heard before. And he even has some equations in the text. And I'm just like, okay, I'm not getting this. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. And uh, so... Obviously a genius, right? Uh, so way over my head. I read The Fundaments of Theoretical Physics, and it just talks about like, you know, the foundation, the principles of like what it's all based on and what its purpose is. And I read The Laws of Science and The Laws of Ethics, uh, which was much more accessible. I feel like maybe it was written for a, a layman audience. In fact, um, a lot of the things stated in there seemed almost obvious, but it's the kind of thing where you want to get it down. It's the you know when you're doing the scientific method or when you're doing uh, you know basic mathematics or whatever. You build on these very basic principles, and that's kind of what this was. It's talking about how science and ethics have different laws and different purposes, but they can be used together. And I thought it was really good. In the Mammoth Book of Modern Ghost Stories, I read A Gremlin in the Beer by Derek Barnes. This one was uh, interesting because the story itself I didn't think was like all that good. But Derek Barnes was an officer in the RAF, the Royal Air Force, during World War I. And he wrote this story about gremlins. So if, you, if you've never heard of a gremlin, or you probably have, but the, the origins of gremlins, uh, I believe, or at least uh, how they first got popular in the English-speaking world, like British uh, RAF officers and pilots would talk about when something went wrong with their plane, they would blame it on a gremlin in the machinery, saying that they were like these little demon spirit type things messing with their stuff, trying to cause trouble. And so this is really interesting because it's one of the very earliest stories about gremlins in the RAF. And it's about a guy having trouble with his airplane, right? Um, and the introduction to this story talks about how like this really could have jump-started Derek Barnes's career except there was another RAF officer who wrote a children's book called The Gremlins right around the same time. I think it was published the same year and that one got really famous and that kick-started Roald Dahl's career. That was the author of that one. Uh, he also served in World War I and Roald Dahl got really famous as a children's author after that. And so uh, I don't know if Derek Barnes would have gotten famous because of this story uh, if Roald Dahl had not like gotten to it first, the, the, the premise of writing about gremlins, uh, but maybe. I also read Money for Jam from the same anthology by Sir Alec Guinness, who apparently was a very famous actor back in the day, uh, but he also wrote stories. And he also served in the military, and this story is based on true events that he lived through. It's about a, a crew on a boat, and they go like there's like a top secret mission that they're going to this island in the middle of the night. And they just run into a lot of problems because this huge storm hits the area. And, uh, and there's a, some supernatural elements to it. And I thought it was actually pretty solid. From Mark Twain on The Damned Human Race, I read Disgraceful Persecution of a Boy and A Defense of General Funston. Both of these are really wonderful examples of how Mark Twain can be very sarcastic and satirical. Both of these they present a sort of premise and you think he's going one way and he kind of twists it and he shows how like how ridiculous that would be. Since I finished Dune, I went ahead and read Blood of the Sardaukar, which is a short story by Frank Herbert's son, Brian Herbert, and Kevin J. Anderson. It's in this anthology, Unfettered 3, edited by Sean Speakman. And uh, I, I really have no plans to read the books by... Uh, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. But since I already own this, I went ahead and read this short story. A lot of people complain about their work. They say it's really awful. I didn't feel like it was bad, uh, honestly. It is a very different writing style, though. Going from Frank Herbert to Brian Herbert and Anderson, 
felt like shifting from Tolkien to Sanderson, right? It's it's just a very like drastic change in prose quality. Uh, but the story, I didn't think it was terrible. It covers some events that happen in the Dune novel, but it basically like gives some background for a character that shows up very briefly in Dune. So not a necessary story by any means, uh, but it's just sort of mildly interesting. Now, the last three stories that I read this month were all by Agatha Christie. Uh, I talked about uh, reading the Hercule Poirot series, and there are a bunch of short stories in that series. So the first one I read was The Adventure of the Western Star, and that's in the collection Poirot Investigates. And uh, it was really good. It's about a missing diamond, or it's like two twin diamonds, uh, and and there's a, the owners get these letters saying that they're going to be stolen and returned to their rightful owners or whatever, and so they're they're trying to protect them, but of course they get stolen anyway, and it, it's really good. In that story, it mentions events from another story, so I did a little digging and I found out that other story came a little bit earlier in the collection Poirot's Early Cases, and that is uh, The Affair at the Victory Ball is about a murder that occurs at a, uh, like a masquerade party type thing. And uh, I thought it was fine. It was not as solid as the Western Star story, but it was okay. It was fun. I went ahead and read the next one in Poirot's Early Cases as well, which is uh, The Adventure of the Clapham Cook. And this is the first Agatha Christie story I've read that I kind of didn't like all that much. I thought it was very convoluted. A lot of Christie's work, like, you could figure out what was happening if you're really good and really attentive. I feel like this one was just out of the blue, out of left field. Like, who's ever going to guess that? It's not bad. Uh, but I just didn't like it as much as the other ones. But anyway, yeah, those are the three Agatha Christie short stories I read this month as well. Whew, okay. Now let's talk about the uh, books that I am currently reading. Oh no, sorry, there's one more short. There's one more short story. We listened to it on, uh, on audio. Uh, we took a, a family trip. I mentioned in the last monthly wrap-up video that we were going to take a trip to Lubbock, I think. Uh, well, that one got canceled. Uh, but we ended up taking a trip to Alamogordo, New Mexico. Uh, it was a work trip for me again, but we took the kids along with us. And we listened to an audiobook version of a short story by Cressida Cowell. It takes place in the How to Train Your Dragon series, and it's called How to Be a Viking. It actually takes place before the How to Train Your Dragon book. It's the first thing in this series. And it's basically just a fun little character study uh, of Hiccup and his dad and their relationship. And it was literally like a five or ten minute story to listen to. And it was cute. We liked it. Okay, that's all of the things that I finished this month. Now to talk about the novels that I am in the middle of still. First up is, of course, Words of Radiance by Brandon Sanderson. I read chapters 67 through 70, I believe it was. I read four chapters uh, this month, which, again, it's not much, but it's what I can do. Um, yeah. I've talked about, as a family, we're reading the Book of Mormon together, so we read like about a chapter a day, sometimes more, sometimes less, uh, but we've been reading that. This month we read from Alma 37 to Helaman 6, which if you know the Book of Mormon, you know that's a pretty significant chunk. If you don't know the Book of Mormon, that means nothing to you, but whatever. Uh, it covers a, a lot of stuff, and inside that chunk is something called the War Chapters, which are really interesting. On a surface level, it's a good story, right? There's... Um, it's, it's these two different nations that are at war and there's dissenters from this group move over to this group and start fighting against their their own uh, brethren. Uh, but there's like spies and there's all these like different strategies and it's kind of cool on a surface level. It's an interesting story. Uh, there's people like poisoning other people and taking over the throne and, th and things like that. Uh, but on a deeper level, uh, we explain this to our kids. Like there's a lot of great metaphors in these chapters. Sometimes people wonder like, why is all this war stuff included in the Book of Mormon? It's supposed to be a scriptural text. It's supposed to help you get closer to Christ kind of thing, you know? Like, why is there all this talk of war for, like, 20 straight chapters? Uh, but there's a lot of these... A lot of this material is a great metaphor. Uh, one example that we talk to our kids about is how uh, Captain Moroni, he's uh, he's the, the leader of the Nephite armies, and he goes to the cities that are closest to the border that are basically the easiest targets for the Lamanites, for this other nation, and he strengthens them. He builds these ramparts around them, and they become some of the strongest cities in his nation. Uh, and we talk to our kids about, like, if you have a weakness, if you, you know, you, you eat too much sugar, or you get angry too easily, or whatever it might be, you can work on that and build on that, and that can become your strength kind of thing. Uh, so anyway, not to get too preachy on you guys, sorry. Uh, that's some of the stuff that we read this month, and I, I really enjoyed it a lot. Uh, along with that, I've been reading Doctrinal Commentary on the Book of Mormon. This is by Joseph Fielding McConkie and Robert L. Millett. 
And it's just really good. It goes like chapter by chapter, sometimes verse by verse, and gives a little commentary and like background and connections and um, just interesting stuff that I've been enjoying reading. Since I finished Dune, I did start Dune Messiah. And I'm only about halfway through right now, a little bit more than halfway. I should have finished this by now, um, but I'm finding that the negative things that people warned me about with Dune that I found were not true about Dune, I'm finding them to be true about Dune Messiah. It is slower. I will go ahead and say that it does kind of drag. It's a little bit more complicated in, in certain ways. Like some characters' motivations are just confusing. Like I'm not really sure exactly what's going on all the time. Um, that being said, uh, similar to Dune, if you just dive in, and just let yourself be immersed in it. It is enjoyable. I am I am liking it. I'm going to finish it soon. Since my wife and I finished Shadows of Self, we started The Bands of Mourning, which is book number three in the Wax and Wayne Mistborn books. And we are, where are we in this thing? We're like about a third, almost half of the way through, and really enjoying it quite a bit so far. My wife really, really loves Steris. So um, this woman, Steris, she takes... She's in the first two books, but she doesn't have a very prominent role. Here, she's much more up front and center. And my wife is, like, just so, like, happy of, of everything I read about her. She keeps stopping me just to tell me how much she loves this character. Um, Wayne is really funny in this book as well. There's a lot of cool stuff with Kondra. Overall, it's just, like, I, I feel like this one's a lot stronger than Shadows of Self. In this story, they have to leave the city. They leave Elendel and they go to New Saran or New Saran. I don't know how you say it. Um, to pursue uh, answers to a mystery. And I don't want to say too much, but it's pretty good so far. Since I finished How Did It Begin, I was kind of looking for another sporadic book that I can just read a, a couple pages at a time kind of thing. And so I started reading The Science of Nutrition by Rhiannon. R Rhiannon? I don't know how you say that. Lambert. And I'm just trying to like eat a little bit healthier or motivate myself to re eat a little healthier. This is nonfiction. It's all about diet and, uh, well, the science of nutrition, right? So uh, trying to learn a few things about what I can do to eat a little bit more healthy. With the kids, since we finished Wayside School, we went on to the next Captain Underpants book. This is number 10 in the series. And this is Captain Underpants and the Revolting Revenge of the Radioactive Roboboxers. So, um... It's just wild. Obviously, it's very wacky. It's very fun. I really like Captain Underpants. I'll be honest. I read this whole series as an adult for my own enjoyment, not to my children. Just, just me alone. Just reading them solo. Uh, now I'm reading them all to my kids. They love them. They beg me to read one more chapter. Um, just really a lot of fun. Really a lot of wacky stuff. The last book that I did not finish this month is one that I'm not going to finish. This is Gatefather by Orson Scott Card. This is book number three in the Mither Mages trilogy. Let me tell you a little bit about the Mither Mages. So I read book one earlier. I listened to it on audio maybe last year or maybe in the spring. And the world building, the lore, the, the magic system, and the plot are really, really good. Really solid. Uh, the characters are kind of hit and miss. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. Um, this is sort of a Percy Jackson-esque type book where it's like, oh, um, you learn that the that the Norse gods and the Greek gods and the Egyptian gods, they're real, um, but they're not really gods. They're just people with superpowers, basically. And, um, and so it's about this kid, Danny North. He's part of the Norse family, and he has the powers of a, of a gate mage. Uh, he has the powers of Loki, basically, where he can, like, teleport and do all kinds of things like that. Anyway... Uh, I don't want to get into the plot too much, but it is really good. It's really fun. But in the first book, this kid is young. He's, I think he's like 10, 11, maybe 12, somewhere around there. So it feels like it's a kid's book, right? It's like young YA or maybe like middle grade. But then out of nowhere, there's like a sexual assault scene. And then you keep going and later on there's like weird discussions about teenage sexuality. Like he goes to, a, a, I guess it is, I guess he's a little older because he goes to a high school. Maybe he's like 16. Um, and he's in this group of kids, uh, boys and girls, and as soon as they find out that he is a mage, that he has these powers, this might be in book two, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. As, but as soon as he finds out that they have powers, as, when they find out he has powers, all the girls want to sleep with him. And one of them like openly, directly says, I want to have your baby because you're magic. And like, <laughs> like what the crap are you talking about? There's a character who uh, every single time she's mentioned, literally without without exception, 
This is in the second book, sorry. Without exception, every time she's brought up, her cleavage is mentioned. And it's she's like a 15-year-old girl. I'm like, why are you talking about this so much? Um, so the second book got a little bit worse with the teenage sexuality and the weird stuff. But again, I was like, I kind of want to see where this is going because the plot is really cool. The actual world and the magic and like all the stuff that's occurring is really interesting. Um, <laughs> but then it kind of comes to a head at the end of the second book where this this like final scene that is super, super key to the plot and it's like this big, almost kind of a twist at the end of the book has to do with a sex scene. It's like in the middle of a sex th thing. Um, and so it's like, oh, that's like kind of weird, right? But still, I was like, well, I still want to find out what's going on. So I started the third book. Sorry, this is turning into a long story. I started the third book and I made it 14% of the way. I'm like, about 50 pages and so far it's just like all about teenage sex stuff like a lot uh way more and it's becoming extremely central to the plot and i'm like yeah i, I don't want to i don't want to continue it's just uncomfortable i'm in my 30s like i don't need to be reading about these kids in this way it's really weird uh so i decided to stop it i'm i i went online and i was able to find out how the book ends and i and i just stayed satisfied with that i um and to be honest, one other thing that I did is I, I think I waited too long between book two and book three because while reading the beginning of this one, I just found myself not really caring what happened in the plot and what happened uh, with these characters. I was like, I don't even really quite remember why I was so invested into this. Uh, right now, it just feels creepy. So I'm going to go ahead and stop kind of thing, right? So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not going to finish this book. Sorry, that was not the last one. Uh, the actual last book, uh, I forgot because it was an audiobook, sorry. Um, on that trip to Alamogordo, New Mexico, we started listening to, after the short story, we started listening to book number two in the How to Train Your Dragon series. It's called How to Be a Pirate, and it's really fun so far. We're at the 40% mark, and we don't have a lot of opportunities to listen to audiobooks at the house. I guess we could just sit around my phone and, and listen to it, uh, but we pretty much just listen to audiobooks while we're traveling. And I do have a bunch of work trips coming up this month. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll probably we'll finish this book this month sometime, uh, but we're about forty percent of the way through How to Be a Pirate, and it's a lot of fun so far. So the characters, the kids from the first book, uh, they're like out on a ship and they're learning how to sword fight on the water, and it's like really it's kind of funny. The kids liked it, and they find this tre this chest, um, or no, I think it's a coffin. It's a large coffin, and uh, and it leads them on this quest, and they they're gonna go discover this hidden treasure or something like that. And yeah, it's just a lot, a lot of fun. I, I actually, I, I found myself being kind of invested and, uh, and interested in where this was going to go. And I know my kids liked it as well. Okay, that is it. That's everything I read in the month of August. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. And I hope you have a great day. Keep reading.